Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to this really exciting conference, which is coming to an end, and I have a feeling that I've missed a lot this morning. Um, I might have been suffering with uh, the huge expectations vis-a-vis -vis a colleague like Mario Draghi, who uh, has to do the impossible at a time when monetary policy has serious difficulties in getting the transmission going between the monetary side and the real economy. From that point of view, my job is much easier because we deal with the real economy directly. And that is a very important thing to do. I go back to the time when Mr. Juncker was considering a bid for the presidency of the European Commission a little over two years ago. And he came to the bank, which he knows so well, having been in Luxembourg in leading positions for more than a quarter of a century. And he asked our economists and our credit specialists and engineers and, and myself, what would your analysis be on the investment situation in Europe? And already at that time, it was, obvious, obvious, it was evident the investment engine in Europe has come to much reduced circulation. The RPM of investment in Europe has gone down drastically with the financial crisis. In 2007, investment in Europe dropped by 20%, which under the circumstances there was not a big surprise. The surprise was it stayed low, not that low, but very low. So we have lost almost a decade where Europe has been looking inside where Europe has been busy with necessary reforms, most of them, I believe, very successful, painful, like reforms can always be. And now we are in the situation that we realize that in these 10 years, almost 10 years, the world around us has moved forward and the comp competitiveness of Europe has suffered. And we have to realize that the biggest challenge we have to face is the preservation of our strong position in the global markets. And that is at stake. When we then gave the analysis to Mr. Juncker, we went beyond the investment gap. We talked about another big gap that is relevant in the global, on the global scale, that is the innovation gap. Because we could clearly demonstrate that the big objective of the European Council to arrive at the situation by 2020 where we would put 3% of our, our resources into research, development, innovation, and education, that we would fail, clearly fail. In some countries in the European Union, we have not even reached 1%. And even in the most advanced countries in the European Union, we are just about making 3%. So this combination of investment gap over 10 years with all the deterioration of the quality of the capital stock and the infrastructure. And at the same time, the innovation gap expressed in insufficient funds for education, research, development, and innovation brings us into a very crucial decision. Now, at that time, Mr. Juncker asked me, a couple of years ago, you asked the shareholders of the bank, which are the 28 member states, to give, us, to give you a capital increase. And we gave it 10 billion euros at that time. We promised to trigger 180 billion additional investment in Europe within three years out of these 10 billion cash injection. And we delivered not in three years, but in 27 months. So we were very encouraged. So he asked us, why don't you do the same thing again? I said, Jean Claude, the situation has changed. Nowadays, liquidity is not the problem anymore. We are drowning in liquidity in Europe. We are going to negative interest rates. The funds are available. The question is, why don't these funds go to the investment projects which you have identified, which seem to be good and promising? And the response is quite clear. It's the, the, the lack of risk-bearing capacity of those which you need for additional projects and additional investment. So the basic idea was born to say, what can we do in order to help promoters and investors carry additional risks or take part of the risk burden from them? And then Mr. Juncker and his new commission came to the really revolutionary idea, which for me was a miracle after having been around European affairs for 30 years, 
It was the decision to shift a part of the budget resources from subsidies to guarantees, from grants to loans. And I think this is the key development that has taken place. And on a smaller scale, we had done it before with research funding. But here, we are doing it now at a very big scale. And that is quite an achievement, and it took difficult decisions in particular from the European Parliament, because you take 16 billion out of the EU budget, out of the authority to decide on the side of the parliamentarians, and give it to those who decide about projects. And the decision about the projects, also in the case of FC, is of course with the bank, with the engineers and financial experts of banks. 16 billion from the EU budget, 5 billion in cash from the bank, that was the basis for, for FC. The regulation was done in record time for European standards. After six months, it was concluded. We signed in June, established the managing director with approval of the European Parliament in October. We have been in parallel already working on projects, and I went to the ECOFIN ministers last month and told them that I can report to you that by end of May 2015, we have triggered more than 100 billion investment out of the 315 promised for three full years. So from that point of view, we are on a very good track. What of course can be said is the new instruments have a different kind of grip on the time scale. SME financing went very fast. So the funds that have been absorbed by SMEs, in particular through the EIF, our subsidiary, which we operate together with the European Commission and others, that has already reached 65% of the levels we have foreseen for three, four years. So that goes faster. That's natural, because big investment projects, be they private or public, take more time to develop, technically and financially. So from that point of view, I'm also uh, in view of the project pipeline that is available in a very good mood. In the next couple of months, we'll see a tremendous surge in approvals of new projects because these projects are maturing now in the designing rooms of the promoters, the member states, and the bank. However, I'm very grateful that Vice President Katainen began his speech by pointing at the real needs in Europe, the reform needs in Europe, because we see regulatory obstacles, all kinds of barriers for investment all over Europe, in the member states, in the European structures themselves, and we are putting us into a very difficult position if we do not courageously begin to remove these barriers. And the second addition, next to FC and the removal of investment barriers, the continuation of the reform processes in Europe, is indeed the advisory hub. On the advisory hub, ladies and gentlemen, we have learned so much via JASPERS and partly Jessica that we could only say this instrument that has been so helpful in allowing the so-called new member state of the European Union to absorb better the funds available for them out of the EU budget is something that is urgently needed in other parts of the European Union as well, and I'm happy that the European Council and ECOFIN at the end decided to open a JASPAS-like instrument in form of the one-stop shop advisory hub to all in the European Union who might need financial and technical advice. It is uh, very uh, important to help people who under normal circumstances would have difficulties in shaping good projects in a way that makes these projects sustainable and viable. Economically viable and sustainable is, are the key words for the European Investment Bank, the EU Bank, because of one simple reason that you must never forget. We do not lend public money. We have a limited capital base by, provided by our owners, the member states, but each and every cent that we lend to potential investors or other borrowers needs to be borrowed from the international capital markets before. We refinance to 100%. And that requires the sale of 70 to 90 billion euros of EIB bonds every year, and you get this money also from non-European sources. The large part comes from non-European sources. 
only if we guarantee the quality of the project. And this is why we are a crowding in bank on two accounts. Number one, we crowd in because we find private investors who entrust us 70 to, 80, 70 to 100 billion euros every year. The second crowding in effect comes with the fact that if the engineers of the bank put the quality stamp on a project design, then others all of a sudden come in and are interested in co-finance. And this is why FC is also so interested, interesting for our partners abroad. Like uh, Vice President Katan has indicated, many countries in the world, their sovereign wealth funds and others, are highly interested in cooperating with us on the basis of platforms or projects in the development of FC and the Juncker plan. Let me say a word briefly on uh, two things which are key. When the bank was founded in the treaties of Rome, nobody would have thought that one day we would be an SME bank. At that time, in the, in the statutes and the treaty is clear, developing the internal market and leveling out regional differences was the name of the game and setting up the infrastructure which was destroyed after World War II. Well, nowadays, obviously, financing of, for SMEs is one key challenge, and it has been made even more difficult with the necessary regulation that has taken place for the banking sector recently. So nowadays, without FC, we are approaching 300,000 new clients in the SME sector every year. And with FC, in 26 member states, mid-sized mid, uh, mid companies and SMEs have already been approached, 140,000 of these SMEs. That's an investment volume that will be mobilized by this of 49 billion euros. So uh, I can assure you the SME part is fully on track, a little bit oversigned already. And the second remark I would like to, to make is the question of risk. There is always a suspicion that the risk-taking inclination of banks is too limited. It is simply a fact that the EU bank has had a capacity to go onto the higher end of the risk scale at a volume of roughly four to five billion euros per year. That was, was still compatible with the capital adequacy ratios and other figures that should be observed if you are a prudent banker. Now with the Juncker plan, with the budget guarantee, taking a part of the risk and putting it away from the shoulders of promoters and other financiers, we are able to, in, to expand that business from four to five billion euros a year to 20 to 25 billion euros a year, and that's exactly what is happening. So both from the side of increased capital inclination and from the side of additionality, I think the Juncker plan will reach its targets. Now, ladies and gentlemen, people seem to be so excited about the Juncker plan that they're already thinking about the future of it. And of course, that encourages us at the bank. The Juncker plan has been designed explicitly as a temporary measure for three years. And Mr. Juncker, in the speech in the European Parliament in 2014, then said, uh, it will depend upon the economic development in Europe and the success of the instruments we take in our hands now, whether it should be continued for another three years or not. Uh, I think the time will come at the end of this year or so to think about uh, exactly this question which uh, President Juncker had put, in the, had put forward in the European Parliament already three years ago. But still, we don't see it as a perpetual measure. We believe that uh, everything must be done to overcome the reasons that led to the necessity to lead to this additional instrument. Finally, let me say one word about the, the budget um, reform that has taken place with this Juncker plan. Better spending. Kristalina Georgieva, the vice president who is responsible for the budget, has put this as the headline over her vice presidency. And I think we are making contribution here. And if it works here, ladies and gentlemen, then I'm wondering why it should not work with other parts of the EU budget as well. The paradigm change from subsidies and grants to guarantees and loans. We, for instance, at the EU Bank are confronted with expectations vis-a-vis -vis activities outside the European Union in the pursuit of objectives of the European Union. 
be they foreign policy objectives, be they development policy objectives, be they climate policy objectives. And we take that extremely seriously. We only do 10% of our business outside the European Union, but even with that small amount, we are the fourth largest multilateral bank outside the European Union for development purposes. If we could one day use a part of the relevant parts of the budget for guarantee purposes and loan purposes, I think we could have a much higher impact on the development perspectives of countries where presently many people have lost hope that they will develop an economic perspective there. And I think that should be approached as well in the next years because we need to come to some kind of a mental change in the view on development policies from, let's say, more of a global social policy oriented policy towards a policy of development of economic perspectives on the ground. That requires a marathon. In comparison to that, the Juncker plan is a sprint. But also the marathon must be begun. And the marathon also begins with the first 100 meters. Thank you very much.